Hello there and welcome back to a brand new DNF1 F1 podcast. I hope that you're all doing well. Thank you as always for being here. And I'm very excited as we are about to preview the Las Vegas Grand Prix, F1's first race in Vegas for over 40 years now. It's been a long time, but certainly we hope it will be worth the wait. But to preview this race and go through all the major talking points heading into this weekend's Grand Prix, we have Lee Wannington on the panel. And joining us for the first time, we have Sebastian Pepperell joining us all the way, no less, from Vegas itself. So first things first, Seb, got to come to you. Thanks for coming on the show. First time on the DNF1 podcast. How are you doing? Hi, I'm great. Yeah, I'm quite. Thanks very much for, for having me. Um, as the event, as the weekend gets closer, uh, excitement and a lot, quite a lot of local tension is hitting on, on all time high as well. So I will be very excited to talk about everything that the Las Vegas Grand Prix will be bringing to the, both the F1, uh, F1 sport and the, the local city as well. And Lee, of course, we've got to come to you as well. First race in Vegas, as we said already, for oh, just over 40 years now. Are you looking forward to seeing what Las Vegas has to offer for F1 in 2023? I'm looking forward to seeing the the new iteration of the race. I think the cars have changed quite a bit in 40 years. So they're, <laughs> for a start, they sound very different to how they were when they um, 40 years ago, um, let alone how they look. Um, but yeah, it'd be interesting to see. It's always... A new circuit always throws up lots of unknown variations because there's no previous data, which you know teams love their data. It's all about data, data, data. Or oh, for American friends, data. But uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, the F1 has come a very, very long way in that time span. I mean, we all remember not us personally because we were all too young for that, but we all remember seeing images and videos of uh, the race in the '80s at the Caesar's Palace car park. It wasn't very popular. Obviously, the American audience in Las Vegas were not very interested in F1 at the time. They'd seen this as the Europeans coming over with their open wheel cars, not overly that interested. But F1's come a long way since then, and there's much more to be promised and much more excitement. And based on some of the renders we've seen, some of the pictures we've seen, and some of the videos we've seen, particularly from the F1 games, this should prove to be quite an exciting race. Or at the very least, the show around it should be quite exciting and one to watch as well. And... Sebastian, I want to come to you first of all. Um, I, I kind of, well, we've seen a lot of news stories around what's been going on in Vegas. And in particular, there's been a lot of negative press that we've seen on social media. Uh, for example, we've seen some of the famous tourist attractions either being shut down or put away temporarily altogether for a few months at a time whilst all of the stands and all of the uh, pieces of track were being put together on the streets. We saw uh, one in particular, the uh, TikToks we've seen a lot of, the the bridge where a lot of people got overpass and a lot of film and a lot of barriers have been put up to try and prevent even locals from being able to see this race without buying a ticket. Someone that is a resident in Las Vegas at this current point in time, can you give us your perspective on everything that's been going down? And also more importantly, what's the local news reporting been like? Right, so the main... Um perhaps unsurprisingly, even to someone who doesn't live here, uh, is the amount of traffic is generated. So the Strip is not really, uh, to locals, considered. It's a place where you go to work. There are sort of like other areas that uh, locals go to to, to, to ha have a good time. But there's a large bulk of the population here, of course. It's a very blue-collar town. Uh, they work on the Strip and or in that proximity. And the Strip you know, kind of unsurprisingly is centered right in the middle, kind of, it kind of cuts the the city in two. And if you're traveling anywhere like east, west, you're going to hit that, all the construction and the traffic has been um, quite, quite intense. Um, even for me, even if I'm not, I don't like, I'm visiting a friend down the south side, it just pushes traffic elsewhere. And of course, Vegas is, founded by the mob and basically the casinos have taken over in terms of they're the kind of sort of like unofficial government um so there's nothing really like local transit there's a bus system um which 
is that, that you know we've got huge roads six lanes road you have to drive for everything here so going to work everyone drives and they have to drive to the strip and there's been a lot of closures and it just pushes out everything um and then of course i follow two two local news uh news sites and initially um to move to something a bit more positive when it was announced about two years ago about a year ago i think two years ago um there was a lot of excitement the governor of nevada came down the clark county commissioner came down and there was a whole announcement about it i think it was probably broadcast by f1 as well and when i was engaging with sort of the local news people didn't really at first didn't really understand f1 like they said like, why can't they use the speedway which is an oval track which is not like it's not like FIA rated at all. And it's, there's no kind of really understanding of what F1 was. And says, why don't, like, what's all this trouble for, like, turning left? Like, they don't really, I mean, there, there's IndyCar here, which is moving increasingly towards road courses. Um, but a lot of people are just like, just put them on that oval track. Uh, and it's like, no, no, that's not going to work. So uh, the traffic is intense. And in fact, something that I haven't seen on the international uh, news feeds is that the culinary union, amidst all the other labor actions taking place right now, the culinary union threatened to strike. Uh, they set a strike date with the negotiations with MGM and Caesars Entertainment that would have affected the Grand Prix and would have potentially canceled it. And perhaps it didn't reach out into international news feeds uh, because you know they didn't want that that negative light on the Grand Prix, um, or maybe it just wasn't you know generally significant enough. Um, but the negotiations were successful, so the Grand Prix is still on. Um, but that was the it was it's been a wild ride for locals um, in terms of all the it's um, I think it's a mixture. I mean, there's there's definitely people out there who are excited, but I'm sure as you know, the negative press always gets the gets blasted a lot more than the positive press as well i was quite initially excited luckily i don't um i'm a stay-at-home parent so i don't have to commute to the to, to the strip so uh i'm thankful to not have to endure they're even t they're even telling workers you know or plan four to five coming to work three to four hours early um and a lot, there's a lot of people talk about oh i'm gonna call in sick on that day i don't want to go or you know use my pto or something like that like basically annual leave um so i don't know how that's going to affect how the grand prix is going to take place on the day and how much basically in terms not the actual f1 or the f1 track itself but all the support around it people going to the casinos restaurants nearby people don't show up to work how is that? I have no idea how that's that's really the kind of wild card, and that's probably not something that you're going to see on the F1 broadcast. You're not you're probably not going to see it on, you know, Crofty and Brundle talk about that kind of thing. Um, but in terms of fans, attendees, it's really kind of that's an additional exciting aspect for me is to see what actually happens on the on the day or at least a three nights for it. No, it's interesting because. Unless I've not been paying attention, I can't really say that I've been seeing many news feeds at all referencing those strikes in particular. And of course, the risk that it could have caused if it potentially put the, the race itself at risk. Um, that's something that you would have expected to make front page headlines. You would have seen, like, for example, that there was obviously talks about the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix potentially being um, postponed or called off owing to what's been going on in the Middle East at the moment. And, you know... Even even though they've been quite adamant that that's not the case and not going to happen, the fact that the Vegas race itself was at serious risk, as you mentioned, of being called off or postponed because of the the strikes, you'd have thought that would have made the news. As I said, unless I've missed it completely, um, it's not something I'd seen at first hand. In terms of the infrastructure itself, because being a street circuit, obviously there's a lot of temporary structures that have to be put into place. I've been hearing some reports in particular that when it comes to putting the stands up and putting the paddock together and obviously closing the roads to make room for the, the barriers which are going to make up the outline of the circuit, what's the time lapse been between obviously the start when the roads were closed and what they propose 
uh, for those roads to be reopened because some people were saying that some of those areas could be closed for quite a few months at a time and and this is a race that is contracted right now to go on for 10 years so you're talking potentially a quarter of the year where people are going to have those inconveniences in the local area just to put on an f1 race for one weekend so the the first phase that they did um was uh it was they it was kind of shocking really so when it not long after the announcement and when things started going rolling the first thing they did was to repave the strip which is it's a massive road about 12 12 lanes not most vegas roads are six um and they did that it was the fastest infrastructure project done in vegas much of the sh- much of the annoyance of everyone else who lives here um there's a long running meme i mean i think many cities around the world experience that where they just lay out cones for no reason it just kind of sits there and you don't see anyone working on working on it uh so that's what's the first thing they did and we did that in a they they cleared it out in a they repaved that the strip in a shocking amount of time and it and a lot of us were like you know couldn't what about all, all the these other main arterials that people use like you be able to um it's the the governance of vegas is a bit strange because you've got the county um you've got the city of las vegas the city of north las vegas you've got a private uh, kind of council area called summerlin and there's a, there's a different interplay of um and at that of different organizations, municipalities, and the strip itself is on, is on what's called unincorporated territory, uh, or Clark County itself is called, called Paradise. Um, but that, that that started, and it was like, oh, that okay, can't you do that anywhere else? But unless, and it has been a steady new, it's been a constant. That's like been the main focus for a shocking amount of time, um, in terms of in terms of, of the local news. And whether or not, I mean, the repaving, like, will it need to be repaved again in 12, in 12 months? If it's going to be, if it's a 10 year contract, then it's going to have to be repaved at some point. Um, you know, there was talks of pedestrianizing the whole strip, uh, which I don't think is going to happen now because I don't think pedestrian, you know, marbling or cobblestone or whatever they choose to use, that's going to be appropriate for, I mean, I don't know what kind of temporary materials they can lay out. So that's kind of torpedoed. Um, I would imagine, um, but I don't even know. Like they're going to reopen the roads fairly quickly, within hours after the checkered flag. They claim they're going to reopen the roads, but then there's the whole process of deconstruction. They removed famous trees from, I believe, in front of the Bellagio, um, and I think even even for tourists, even for the locals, it was like the locals have some attachment to the strip, particularly those. There's so much people that work there um so it's very unfortunate that um to for them to see these kind of major changes take place and i know is it the um there was an apology kind of not really an apology that the, the verbiage was very interesting he said uh we apologize for the difficulties in bringing long-term investment towards uh towards the i'm giving very much the kind of clickbaity phrasing they used um but the way vegas is i mean it really shouldn't surprise anyone that lives here that long we don't really see the effects of that long-term investment in terms of the school systems and everything else there's a lot of uh, people that moved here from california that aren't really attached to the strip um they're kind of looking for a sort of loss like a sort, sort of southern california exurb to kind of settle in um but yeah that, so long-term investment that's what they're claiming who that investment uh who who the dividends are uh for um we're not sure if we're going to see that um and that i think is an additional factor which is kind of upsetting a lot of the locals um but you have to give it i'm giving it the benefit of the doubt um because i i had to i'd explain to a lot of locals here particularly those who want you know americans are famously not very uh worldly not through, through any fault of their own of course it's a, it's a large country there's no other nearby countries right um but i'm um, they i'd explain them like f1 is going to be bigger than edc um and it's going to be bigger than the super bowl which is coming here or it may, i mean because the super bowl is of course concentrated to one stadium um 
of course, the F1 is shutting down the whole strip. I mean, really, it's kind of shocking just the scale of what's being brought to the city. And I don't think the locals really grasped it. Um, attendance is going to be, a, attendance is estimated 105,000. That 1970s or Caesars parking lot Grand Prix was just like, they com- they did a side-by-side comparison of the track and the original Caesars parking lot, I don't think, whatever it was called, uh, was like this big. And it was just, it was like a kind of like, a sort of like autocross really with the way they just kind of like coned it off. And then like, the strip itself one is no i'm like my hands aren't big enough to, to convey the difference uh, but i don't know yeah i'm i'm just being here uh talking with you you fellas about it i'm leaning more to want to be be optimistic because i'm relaying all this kind of negative stuff and i'm just like i don't know like it's you know no, no one wants to be completely negative but um i'm 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 cautiously optimistic and if I'm even then I'm also excited to watch the chaos a bit and it's easy, a very privileged to be able to say that because I don't work on the strip so um so that's the that's a kind of like fashion for it or I don't know what the proper expressions are kind of just watching and being like oh yeah let's see what happens <laughs> No, I mean, it sounds very, very interesting. And of course, we always have these stories of reservations about new races, particularly the local news as well. But of course, when the race gets underway and we look back on the weekend and F1 packs up and goes home, maybe people will feel a bit bit more positive. As I said, it's the anticipation, I suppose, of this event. We'll just have to wait and see how it all goes down. In terms of the race itself, one of the big factors that I think a lot of people are quite surprised about is the timing of the race itself now local time it's going to be very very late and you know if you're based in europe in the uk i strongly advise you check what time the race is going to be on because it's like almost kind of working a day back to accommodate all of the worldwide te- television audiences uh, and, and as a result we're going to get a night race in vegas as we expected but it's also going to be very very cold and by F1 standards. And look, the Vegas weather at the moment, I was having a look. You're talking around the low to mid 20 degrees, which is absolutely perfect for Formula One racing. But of course, the race isn't going to happen at this time of the day. And that's quite critical. So what we're going to end up getting is potentially one of the more cold, if not one of the coldest races we've had in terms of ambient temperature in F1. We're looking at degrees potentially, and this is basically for anyone on the metric system, so apologies to the uh, American listeners tuning into this that won't know what I'm talking about here, but we're talking degrees of 7 or 8 degrees Celsius during the race itself. And as a result of that, it's going to create some real tyre warming issues and issues with performance. And we've heard so much about teams and drivers complaining about struggling to get tyre temps in. It could prove to be a crucial factor this weekend. Lee, bringing you into this point, um, how do you think it's all going to play out with these colder temperatures in Vegas? Well, it's, as you already highlighted, it's going to be the effects on the tyre temperatures and, and also the brakes. So the brake warm up and obviously... Um, the brake warm up obviously affects the tire temperatures in itself. So if you're on an unlucky team that has issues keeping the temperature in your brakes, you're going to have issues with your temp to your tires, which is going to affect your grip levels. Which you're going to get oversteer, understeer, depending on your setup. You, you may even see quite a few lockups, which means plenty of pit stops. So um, it may lead to more action. If you recall the race in Turkey, was it 2020 uh, when they yeah. did the surface for the COVID race, and it was just slippery as anything uh, that's pretty much what i'm probably expecting from this weekend which is makes it different but it's a bit of an oversight from formula One management that they didn't seem to take in temperatures and variations for effectively a, a desert climate wait well, i say effectively it is a desert climate and uh, big temperature swings through day and night time and let alone being in the equivalent of the winter obviously seb can speak to more about how the how harsh the vegas winter is at not that I yeah. know much about it. So that's the thing. You 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 got to put a pretty large asterisk, particular um, next to the degrees that you've given, um, because you know a lot of your viewers, particularly UK viewers, are used to like the t- more temperate climate. So you have the the humidity. Um, like my wife and I are so used to living here that when we go to a regular temperate climate like California or when we visit the UK. Uh, we call it humid. It's not humid. It's just regular. 
um, you know, and it affects everything from uh, our, my hair, my skin, our, our kids' hairs and whatnot. That eight, seven degrees Celsius is frigid. It's low humidity. It feels a lot colder than what it would in the same amount of temperature back in the back in the UK. Uh, so that is something to really kind of take. And that's kind of another, like there's so many wild cards. People talk about new, the new track or the locals perspective. How's it going to affect the locals? Um, but in terms of, yeah, tech and driving, uh, it's an, an, another wild card. But they are running. I do believe they are running practice at night too. Because then I was, I would have been all over very excited to see uh, if they ran practice during the day. I think qualifying is at midnight local time. Uh, yeah. But all the practice times are in the evening, which is, I was like, oh, darn it. So they will get some data for that. Um, but then there's, you know, there's, there's running at race pace, uh, which, and then there's running, running at, at quality pace, which you might may or may not be doing for a longer period of time during practice, right? Um, so, and, you know, being a street circuit, it's, I mean, it's not as tight as Singapore, I don't believe. Um so no, they're going to be using a wide berth here. But I think the big challenge, of course, and, and we should mention that the teams obviously are going to be allocating more of the softer tyres this weekend. because There'll be the much easier tyre to get up to temperature. Um, obviously, because of the lower temperatures, they won't be subject to wear too much. And more importantly, there's not going to be many high speed corners on this circuit at all. So in terms of the, the lateral loads that are going to be going to go on these tyres, it's going to be quite minimal compared to other circuits as well. And and you've got a lot of high speed sections. We've got that long DRS section uh, towards the end of the lap. So it's going to be a huge challenge for the teams and drivers this weekend. You know, Lee, you pointed out that have F1 really thought about this? Well, we've had a lot of reports, one in particular from Bernie Eccleston. Um, he basically went out and said that F1 really haven't played any con- or given any consideration to the sport or the fans in terms of wanting a race at Vegas. It's been purely monetary driven. And as Bernie said, it, it's not what F1 is about. So, I mean, f- given it's come from Bernie Eccleston, take from that what you will. But um, F1 is branching out into newer audiences and newer venues. A Vegas race always looked to be on the cars when F1 was growing in popularity, particularly in the States. So it will be very interesting. We'll have to keep an eye out who that benefits, who t- may struggle as a result of that. Uh, but it will be interesting to see. I do want to move the conversation on because uh, we covered Vegas in quite a huge depth there. So I'm very grateful for that. Um, first things first, uh, Haas, obviously there was a uh, review or their right to review that they put forward an application over the track limits debate in the US Grand Prix uh, recently. That got rejected, um, that the right to review wasn't successful. So they wasn't able to go through that process. In terms of the track limits debate, though, guys, if we can just sort of move this a bit sideways onto that, what are your thoughts on track limits right now? Is there something that F1 really needs to do to get on top of this? Or is it a case of the track limits are there, the drivers have just got to get on with it and stop complaining? Um, I want, what are your thoughts, Lee? Uh, I, I think this is a situation that needs to be resolved one way or another. You either uh, just say, yeah, track limits... Pff- just go over, go off wherever you need to. It's fine. It's just a bit of pain. Go set your fastest time. We don't really care. Or it's a hard limit that any exemption uh, or any uh, car or going over the white line, which is the definition of the edge of the track, is, I mean, all four tyres, obviously, because obviously you're allowed two or three off or one off, um, is lap time deleted. What we have now is a bit better than it was in the last few years, but it's still not good enough because some cars are, like Hass's example, there was a lot of instances where cars weren't even picked up as going over track limits. And it's just a mess and it's bringing the sport into disrepute again, um, which is not from, this is the FIA, not getting a handle of it and the track organisers. We know one hard and fast way to stop track limits is um, walls. I'm not saying every track should be a street circuit, but if you stick a wall on it, they're going to go into the wall. So therefore, that's all your track limit. Or you gravel track it. Just the current state of it, in my opinion, is just not working. They need to fix it because it's just making it look the sport look silly. And this is supposed to be a top of motorsport, global motorsport, and it's they do all these silly little errors that they don't have the act together. It's just just really not good enough. I mean, basically, what you're advocating for, Lee, is turn F1 into Formula E. 
pretty much yeah. solves the track limits debate. <laughs> well, a bit, a bit weird, dis- more distance than Formula E and a bit louder. Um, yeah. And also necessary street circuits because I quite like some of the cla- on the classic tracks. Just it was just an example of a way to enforce the track limit of a, with a wall. Of course, yeah. I mean, we we've heard the gravel trap debate as well that you know F one should adopt like the more classical circuit approach where if you go offline, like for example at Zandvoort, there's probably a prime example there. If you go offline, you're going to go in the gravel and, and that's your punishment. But uh, it's an interesting debate. Um, Seb, I'm obviously curious to get your thoughts on this as well because the stewards pointed out to the FIA that they weren't really given the necessary equipment or provided with the necessary tools to actually make definitive decisions on track limits in these examples. And they weren't happy about that at all. So, I mean, any thoughts on this, in your opinion? What would you like to see happen with track limits? Um, Is there any ideas you might have on that? Well, with this debate, I can't help but think of the uh, virtual referee system. I forgot the acronym that they use in... Oh, VAR. Right. Um, oh, but boy. then if, you know, if all cars were equipped with, you know, a mandatory component that would monitor that. But then if you get into like wheel to wheel action, so if like my first thought was, oh, let's have it when they go off, like they, they're instantly triggered. Um, now, whether that automatically applies a penalty versus it will go to the, it'll be, it'll be sent to the issuers is I mean, maybe more so the, the latter, but if you've got like a wheel to wheel situation going on, um, I mean, that might be, that might work if a track limits violation is then sent to the, the steward's office rather than instantly applying a penalty. But then this is a thing you've got like a human's like a human enforced wall system is down. It doesn't go down to robots. It goes down to this like maybe three of us kind of having this conversation about and that nuance and then when and, and then when it comes out on the other side the audience aren't exposed to the the whole breadth of conversation that took place um but yeah maybe a virtual system to or something like that but i know i think it, after the, the, the u.s grand prix i think several days later it's then revealed how often perez went over the line and nothing happened with him um but the cool thing about my sort of initial so without thinking about it too much is if you have that that automatic system and like just throw penalties like out like just keep just hammer them with penalties like more readily apply that it might make a more interesting race in terms of putting up the stakes so if you can expect a larger a proportion of drivers getting uh getting penalties you know, I think that might might mix thing might mix things up a bit. Might be what what the sport needs, um, but I imagine there might be there's probably going to be a lot of resistance from the teams and from the drivers over such a system. But the inconsistency, I think, has been has been a nightmare, and it has really kind of like you know, it's yeah, I, I it's like what what Lee already said. It's kind of made it a bit of a bit of a joke in that regard in that in keeping the sport serious and consistent well the inconsistency is the bane of the problem with track limits and we see this a lot on social media a lot of people point out when drivers have done things not been punished for them and sometimes like football for example you can take it out of context to try and create a narrative when there really shouldn't be one when it comes to the stewards itself i'm i feel like the race director and and, and again this is probably something that should have been implemented more seriously during Charlie Whiting's tenure there uh, before he sadly passed on. And, and and that is that they should be consistent about where the track limits are being refereed over the course of the weekend because they used to be changing all the time depending on the time in the session. It used to create so much confusion. I, I feel like if you make it clear and obvious to the drivers where those track limits are going to be enforced and just stay consistent with those. And, and more importantly as well, just tell those drivers to stop moaning about it. I mean, I know there are certain circumstances where a driver might make a minor error which sends them wide and they lose time and it gets chalked up as a track limits violation when perhaps it shouldn't compared to someone actually trying to gain an advantage off the circuit. There's obviously a scenario there where perhaps a subjective or an objective opinion is probably needed from the stewards whether to enforce a track limits violation or not. But other than that, Drivers will always try and game the system as far as they can go. If you give them a, an inch, they will try and take that and then take a mile after that to go faster because they know that's the fastest way around. So sometimes I'm just sitting there hearing drivers complain about it and just say, look, 
guys, stop moaning about it. Just stay within the white lines. It should be as simple as that. But of course, we could be talking about this in its own episode entirely. And I'm sure you guys listening in will be happy to chime in with your opinions on this. So do let us know what your thoughts are on the track limits debate. How would you solve it? And uh, maybe we'll do an episode on this in the off season. Next topic of discussion I wanted to do to discuss with you guys. Ferrari are reported to have uh, restarted or reinstated talks with Charles Leclerc over a new deal. His current one expires at the moment at the end of 2024. And there's a lot that's been going on throughout the last few years with Charles Leclerc. Some good and plenty bad with Ferrari, which begs the question, are Ferrari happy to put all their eggs in the Leclerc basket as their main driver for the next few years or the foreseeable future? And also, is Ferrari the right team for Charles Leclerc in terms of achieving his ambitions of being a a serial race winner and also a world champion? So what are your thoughts, guys? Lee, let's come to you first. Um, Should Leclerc stay with Ferrari? And more importantly, should Ferrari continue with Charles Leclerc? Or is there a better option out there for them? So, firstly, my understanding is his contract expires the end of next season. Um, so, for me, I, I think it makes sense for Ferrari to hold on to Charles. He's not quite the finished product, product although he's obviously been racing Ferrari for many years now. He's very fast, but seems to... Not, he admittedly not had the car um, as much as he sh- under him, as much as he should have be reliability or in just the, the performance of the car. But he hasn't always brought it home. I mean, Max has a higher um, Charles pole win conversion rate than Charles does of his own poles, which is not a very good stat for Charles. But it just gives you kind of an example that Charles can be fast, but he can't always bring it over the line. But is that uh, always him, or is the no, car it's not a big part him. of that world? Because without yeah. context, you're absolutely right to point that out. But a lot of people will come and argue and say, "Well, if he was driving a Red Bull and doing the same thing, chances are his win ratio would be much oh, more yeah. impressive." Of course, it would be more impressive. But um, I mean, for he, he needs a bit more hand holding, which is why the Fred Vasseur is there at Ferrari to encourage and grow him, and obviously get him out of his head a little bit. He does suffer in his head a bit when performances don't go his way. Um, mainly due to reliability and Ferrari strategy being the biggest highlights. Um, but the, the, the for Charles, I'm not sure Ferrari is the right thing for him. He's had he suffered a lot. It's quite a lot of mental fatigue from all the failures and mistakes from Ferrari. Yes, he's had his own mistakes, but they're outnumbered by Ferrari's errors. Uh, but I would, if I was him, I would sign him for two years. See the state of play for twenty six, or maybe one year extension. Really, I get the twenty five. See the state of play for twenty six, especially if the Audi project comes along. As although there's the, the rumours that Audi may be pulling out, but they've denied it. I, I'm ignoring those rumours completely. But you see how those how Audi goes, especially. Will that be a time to jump ship to the an incoming new team? Be that team lead. But apart from that, he's got nowhere else to go. So if he's there at Ferrari, I think that's really. Um, where he's in the future is going to go unless he looks at that Audi project. I think that's kind of the important thing there. There's nowhere else to go at this point in time because if every seat was theoretically available and they all wanted Leclerc, we'd probably all say that he should move on to the best possible seat he can. But at the moment, that appears to be where he currently is at Ferrari right now. And, and, and as we've seen other drivers leave good seats in the past to try and take a gamble and go for the jackpot, more often than not, they tend to come up short. I mean, I I think the last time I saw a driver do that and it proved to be successful was Lewis Hamilton. And since then, we've seen Fernando Alonso go from team to team to team trying to do the same thing, never really getting close to achieving what he would have wanted. The only exception to that would have been Ferrari and he very nearly did do that. But otherwise, it's been a career of what ifs with Fernando Alonso. And obviously, we've seen with Daniel Ricciardo more recently how that's not really worked out for him to a point where... He's not exactly, I mean, okay, Red Bull are probably looking at him now, but it's only through circumstance rather than through out and out desire to get him in. So it is an interesting one with Leclerc. Uh, Seb, I'm, I'm intrigued to get your thoughts on this as well. One thing in particular, I do want to pinpoint what Leclerc said on the team radio uh, during the Brazilian I Grand was going to bring that up. That referred, was, that oh, well, was... I might as well lead lead you to that then, because um, as soon as you're going to bring it up, obviously referring to the, the fact that he kept saying, oh, why am I so unlucky? For me, this was the first time Charles Leclerc had openly acknowledged that through no fault of his own, 
he's having these issues and losing results that he has worked so hard to get. I mean, we go to the Bahrain race earlier this season. He was nailed on for a podium until reliability issues. This was the first time where you could kind of infer from that statement that he was criticizing his own team for the first time for not being able to provide him with the tools he needed to get the job done. Um, I mean, what are your thoughts? So, yeah, so when, when I saw that happen on the formation lap, no less, um, I thought it was a driver error. Um, I'm not, it was a hydraulic failure, if I believe. Yeah, the engine yeah. shut off and obviously right. loss of hydraulic pressure. But, I mean, yeah. it's, it's interesting you interpret that as, well, actually, no, I suppose you're right. Because when he's, my initial thought was when he says, oh, why am I so unlucky? He's doing what Lee referred to and that he's kind of, it's just kind of a bit too nice and he just kind of generally oh it was just a bad twist of fate it wasn't my fault it wasn't the team's fault because you have equally have them out drivers that would just be like what do you what what the f you guys doing with this why 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 did this happen or they'll be angry at themselves um so it, I, I that was very interesting it was a very extremely memeable statement um but yeah as soon as that radio message came out i was like oh yeah that's gonna be that's that that's gonna be one for the you know for the season's history book at least um but how many yeah. times have we seen Charles Leclerc on the radio moaning after a crash or an incident and he always blames himself yeah and you I know, we forget the we forget the strategy blunders and everything else put that all aside it was just the first time that had happened and I was expecting him to say as you thought that he blamed himself for a stupid mistake but for me it felt like some frustration is really coming out now um over the team and perhaps he might be losing confidence that they can give him the tools he needs to try and win a world championship well i think sergio perez's contract ends 24 now this is probably like this is a pure sort of silly season sort of stuff but i really kind of wondered oh why not if he goes to red bull because those two have a history to get you know a positive history together but gosh i mean if anything about that cursed red bull second seat is would apply to him <laughs> he'll be even less of a man by by the end of if you know if he joins Red Bull or whatever. Um, but yeah, I think. I mean, we can ask the question, you know, what team? Where should he go? You know, what contract should he sign? But he really sounds like he needs to get it together with himself. Um, I would, you know, I think, I think if he should have played in team, then I think he should be more direct about it. Maybe he's yeah, maybe maybe you're right. Maybe he's finally reaching out and not. And not, you know, being so too humble. I mean, F1 is a very driver, you know, driver-driven driver sport in terms of the personalities. And I think he's just maybe, yeah, maybe he's a bit too nice. And if he just was a little less nice, a little bit less nice, he would find a lot more success. Um, he could, I feel like things have improved with a with, with new team principle. Um, there's been some, you know, not as embarrassing blunders this season, I don't think, compared to like Monaco, was it Monaco 21 uh, or 22? No, 22, Monaco 22. Well, we had Melbourne earlier this year, where I think he was a bit overzealous to recover a bad qualifying performance and he ended up binning it on turn three, I think it was. Right. And yeah, then other than the that, there haven't been then, many. And then the Fr French Grand Prix 22, because we all thought 22 mm. was going to be now Leclerc versus, and that was probably the biggest disappointment for me. Uh, I mean, it's a lot to expect, constant one view, you know, battles for the championship uh every single season um yeah i think it's probably what many people have said before charles needs to get a bit of a backbone he's too nice but is i mean of course he's, he's he, I, I, would, I wouldn't say too nice for the sport because he still what he lacks in being having a backbone he makes up in driver's talent most of the time um, but yeah, I know. I, I think I'll be curious if he does a one year, if he does a one year contract extension, I think that's a clear sign that things are going to be, be up in the air. Um, or rather that he's not as confident if, it, if he does a one year extension, if he does a two year one, then it's more like, yeah, it's probably a bit more, more open in that regard. Yeah. I mean, personally, I can't see a scenario where Ferrari offer him anything less than like a free four year deal because they need, the, I mean, you raised a really good point there, Seb, that, you know, through some of these issues that Charles has had, we can't ignore the fact that Charles himself has made quite a few driver errors. And that has brought question into his credentials of being able to see out a world championship over the course of the season. We know he's blindingly quick, arguably the best individual qualifier in the sport at this point in time over one lap pace. But 
you know, you, you can't win a world championship by being fast on, on a Saturday. You have to deliver that on a Sunday. In a weird way, Ferrari's driver lineup with Sainz and Leclerc is definitely the one that I expect them to continue with for the foreseeable future. But in a way, both of their strengths do tend to complement each other. If there was a way where you could combine both of Sainz's strengths with his uh, race craft and his strategic mind and his more calmness under pressure than Leclerc, I think is probably fair to say. We saw that in full force during the uh, Singapore Grand Prix and how brilliant Sainz was at getting the job done there with Leclerc's natural pace, feel and, and also raw drivability that he has and skill. You would have one hell of a Formula One driver. But that's kind of the conundrum Ferrari have, you know, in that regard. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. As I said, I'm fairly confident that if the circumstances are correct, both will agree a new long term deal. But there are certainly questions on both sides that definitely need to be answered if they do commit their future beyond their current agreement. Um, Let's move on. And there was an interesting stat that I saw this week. And apparently um, 2023 is the first time in F1's history that five different constructors have at least scored seven podiums or more. Now, just to ratify the numbers, Red Bull have got 27. No surprises there. McLaren have got nine. Aston Martin have got eight. And Ferrari and Mercedes have both got seven each. Um, Obviously, Max Verstappen has been on the top step for a lot of those. But it's very impressive that we've had a season where there's been a lot of success across the board rather than just the obvious in Max Verstappen, which can be very easily overlooked. So... I suppose the question to that is, are we as F1 fans that are complaining about F1 being a bit boring because Max is winning every single week, are we putting too much stock in that and ignoring the fight that is going on behind him? Or despite the success of the other teams, are we still right to feel aggrieved that we've got four great teams fighting it out over the next two spots on the podium, but nobody anywhere near good enough to topple Max and Red Bull off that top step? Yeah, I I think... A lot of recent F1 fans have been spoilt um, by the 21 season. Obviously, especially in America, Drive to Survive has really increased the popularity of the sport. But across the globe, it's obviously um, part of the Liberty Media have really driven the, uh, the obviously the the uptake of the the sport uh, around the world. And 21 is a pinnacle of a championship fight all the way to the last race, equal on points. Yes, it was spoiled how FA handled it, but the championship itself was amazing to watch. Um, I'm not, I'm not, just, I'm not having a good dig at uh, and Max tire to a Lewis tire, just to clarify, I'm just saying uh, they're just uh, uh, how they ended. Um, but the, the racing was brilliant and it was fairly enjoyable. And then this year's happened. And a lot of those more recent fans are going, what's happened to 21? This was, this is amazing. Why has the sport come so boring? Um, which has not helped um, some of the viewership numbers. But the more um, fans that have been a bit more long-term in the sport have a bit more knowledge about the team's histories or driver history, can just get entertainment from the, the fundamentals of Formula 1, racing. If it's the for the lead of a race, a lead of the championship, or just the teams behind, it's very impressive that we've got these five constructors. Um, uh, I've thoroughly been enjoying the, the best of the rest fight this season because it's just been so damn close. It reminds me a little bit of 2012, where the, we, I think it was seven different winners in the first seven races. Um, yeah, uh, Sebastian went on to win that title. Not this Sebastian on this channel uh, right now. The <laughs> Sebastian. <Vettel. laughs> oh, you didn't have to explain that. We could have tricked the listeners on the audio only that we managed Vettel, to get right, himself. Right. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> Seb. <laughs> um, but it, that was a great um, first seven races, and I, I, I think it's we got to give the hats off to all those constructors to get those seven, a minimum of seven podiums. It's a brilliant achievement for the sport and the engineering behind, which shows you the success to a degree that the new, these new rules have had on the sport that it is tightened the field up minus um, Max, um, the other constructors. It's been really um, intense this season. I mean, what are your thoughts, Seb? Is the collective battle behind Max Verstappen sufficient enough for us to enjoy F1 in its current format or is the headline of who is winning the world championship or what is the battle for the world championship looking like the main priority at the moment what should it what should it be I mean I grew up on I imagine the same with the two of you are the sort of Schumacher era right so similar amount of domination 
Uh, I can't, I mean, I'm a bit too young to remember the nuances of each race. And then, of course, we had Lewis Hamilton for most of the 2010s. Um, and I, I have to wonder if it's, yeah, the 2021 season, I think even as, even as, I, I don't know if it's because it might be the American influence, of course, mentioned by Drive to Survive. Um, you know, in British culture, and F1, of course, has a heavy British influence uh, in terms of its ownership, in terms of the management in various teams. You know, and it's very much part British culture. You know, it's the taking part of that counts kind of thing, right? And then, of course, the American way, which is going to be number one, right? Um, so I don't know how much that plays into it. It kind of that those kind of two concepts, like not in a way you could easily identify you know, where those kind of cultural differences are playing a part. It kind of just weaved itself in a narrative when you have, especially with, you know, the US and UK sharing a same same language that plays a lot of it, right? But um, yeah, I'm thinking about 2021 and if anything, I'm going to be a bit more optimistic. If anything, these multiple podiums from different, you know, different teams might very well bode good news for 24 for those looking for multiple winners per season. Um, in terms of, I mean, myself, my interest has not been as strong. Um, I mean, I'm, I live here in the States. I'm a British American, so I've always been torn between two cultures so i kind of like you know the number one fight kind of a bit um but because in the end of the day like the person that gets you know the way oh gosh this is very much very, very much america the american in me talking which is very much you know, it doesn't matter man you got to be number one uh so i would like yeah i best of best fight is good but um i would like to see more winners um you know, IndyCar as well, you know, it's a spec series amongst a lot of diehard motorsports fans. Uh, IndyCar's kind of like moved up a bit and they shift the road courses. Um, there's always different winners and whatnot. Um, but nah, yeah, you know what? I'm, I'm going to lean on the opposite of Lee. I would like to see more winners. Hell yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's always a good thing, to be honest. Um, I mean, I hope that in 2024 it's more likely it might be 2025 it all depends really on how close to that performance ceiling Red Bull are at this point in time but what we're hearing from them they're not close to it yet but they will be very close to it in 2025 so obviously that's the hope that everyone will catch up by then but we sincerely hope that you know going forward that the teams that are in the chasing back right now that is of course McLaren Aston Martin Mercedes and Ferrari by virtue of what we saw from Aston Martin and McLaren uh, the beginning of last season, and of course McLaren going for this season, that there is ground to be made and you can have a very gr strong winter and close the gap. But of course, that depends on what Red Bull do over the winter as well, because everyone can make huge steps forward, like Ferrari, for example, thought they had a car that might be competing for a world championship. Can honestly say they were woefully under, well, overestimating the performance of their car compared to what Red Bull were going to do. So we live in hope. We'll just have to wait and see on that one. So that brings us nicely over to the predictions category of this episode. And for those of you that are new, Seb included here, that we have a set list of different prediction categories that we run through and we try our best to try and demonstrate our will knowledge by accurately predicting those. Over the course of the season, I promise I will tally these up by the season end, but we've probably been pretty bad, I think it's fair to say, this season, despite the trends that we could go back to, with the exception of Max winning, of course, because that's a very easy one. I don't even think we should get points for that one. But uh, we'll see how that all goes down towards the end of the season. But do play along if you are listening in and you want to get involved, get involved in the comments section on YouTube. And of course, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. So the first category is the best surprise. Now this goes to the driver or team that we think will provide the best good surprise of the weekend. Seb's already got his thinking cap on by the looks of it. He's very deep in thought. So I'm going to go over to you first, Seb. What's your best surprise going to be this weekend or who is going to be your best surprise this weekend? Uh, I, I actually interpret, uh, I was thinking best surprise as in, you know, who's going to hit the wall. And I just, I'm, I'll, I'll, <laughs> that could I'll be a surprise if you want. <laughs> well, I, see, I mean, <laughs> no, see, I mean yeah. some of us don't like seeing that, but whatever, is that right. the American thing? Is like, you know, you want to see carnage. So <laughs> I know, I know, I know, Ricard, I know Ricardo is probably the most excited. He's all, you know, he always loves Kota, right? But I think he's been the most excited about one of the most excited uh, running for Vegas. I think a lot of the other, that may play into it. I know a lot of the, I remember watching Lando Norris uh, do the, the F1 23 game 
on his channel or some sort of promo he ran a lap and he said like that's it um oh that was it because there's you know it's very like you said not very it's a very las vegas it is a grid i was really honestly surprised how they were going to bring an interesting track here and it's well i'm not sure they did um so i there may be, I, i'm wondering if the other driver's apathy towards the track itself maybe to their detriment leaving i don't know i think ricardo's very excited about it so i think maybe we might see something from ricardo we see some interesting uh, quali- qualifying performances from him um since his return so i'm in terms of what that surprise is i couldn't give you what a number but it's going to be maybe you know i don't know not maybe shy of a podium you know somewhere between p4 and p7 or something like that oh i like that and and ricardo has been on a good patch of form of course in brazil it didn't really work out for him but it was quite unfortunate with the damage to his car but uh if Red Bull are very much keen on bringing Ricardo in, obviously a good weekend at Vegas of all places will certainly not hurt his chances. Lee, this comes to you. Who's your best surprise this weekend? All right, it's going to make you happy, Adam, but I would say Ferrari. I was um, thinking Ferrari too. The, go on, you go first. They're normally a, a team that really overheats their tyres and therefore eats through their tyre life. As this is a track that's not expected for tyre wear to be a problem. The fact that it overheats its tyres will actually be, a, I think, it'd be a benefit when we've touched on temperatures earlier on in this episode. Um, so I think they'll be able to get temperature, sustain a temperature in the, the brakes, sustain a temperature in the tyres, which will obviously give them an edge of performance over the the race. Um, and I think they're going to be a, a, a quite a strong package this weekend. And let's not forget as well, in terms of cooling, Ferrari are a team that have struggled with that this season. They have a very tight package uh, for the for their car this year, the SF23. And I think the, the ingredients are there. Like you say, you know, a lot of high-speed straights. We know Ferrari are quite rapid on the straights and some slower corners at, on that mechanical grip. So it could be a strong weekend for them. I think Seb's sort of uh, deep yeah, in no, again. As soon as you mention straights, I'm thinking of Williams again and Albon. Mm. Um, so that might be... Because I, I don't know if it's shifted recently. I remember... Um, but Albon's uh, Williams' performance on the straights has been pretty. I forgot it was a few about a few races, not maybe mid year. We're talking Belgium, there, I think. Yes, there was a one yeah. where it was who was someone was struggling to in Belgium. Yeah, it was Belgium because I remember it was on T. It was after uh, De La Rouge on that long straight. Uh, someone was really struggling to overtake Albon, and it was not a back marker type of. Oh, wasn't it one of the? Wasn't it one of the mistakes? Wasn't it Russell? I was thinking, Mercedes, I was, that was my gut, Mercedes. So yeah, I'm sure obviously Hamilton got on the podium that weekend, so it might have been... I'm, I'm probably wrong. I know Hamilton was at the front end, so it might have been Russell that you were thinking of. But uh, yeah, no, it's a good point. I mean, you can throw Albon in there at some other part. There's, I'm sure there's another prediction, like there's a bowl prediction there, so you can always chuck Albon in for a good... Well, Lee, yeah, um, Lee is clearly the tech guy. I'm more of the... Um the kind of softer guy in terms you like of the fun it. stuff you're not oh, interested yeah, in the crashes, the I'm crashes. Gonna say, <laughs> crashes. Ricardo likes Vegas that's clearly a basis for him to win an extremely technical sport right so I'm yeah. gonna... Seb's <laughs> expecting like monster trucks and stock cars halfway through I mean there's no support races so we've got to get something in there Seb maybe well, there you're right that's right. oh yeah I, it doesn't even occur to me I haven't heard anything about that um yeah there's been but... none of that there's going to be some entertainment so yeah you'll have to let us know what they've got cooking but uh we'll see but uh, um, this will move on to flop of the weekend. Um, I'm just going to be bold straight away for the exact same reasons why I think Ferrari are going to be strong. Um, Mercedes, I think, are going to struggle. Um, as I said, the high speed nature of this circuit in the straights, we know that Mercedes is a very draggy car, so that's obviously going to cause them a lot of problems. And in addition to that, because of the cold temperatures, not to be too techy, but the air is going to be denser, it's going to be thicker. That's going to cause Mercedes some problems and uh, it could prove to be a tough weekend for them, in my opinion. Yeah, that, that makes sense, um, to be perfectly honest, Adam. Uh, for me, uh, I think Haas is going to be the flop. Um, obviously, they're, they're reverting Nico's car um, to even the upgrades from Nico's car. They're, I think they're a bit lost at the moment and across the cold temperatures, I think. Haas is just going to have a nightmare weekend, unfortunately, for them. Yeah, they usually do. Uh, how about you, Seb? Who's your flop this weekend? Uh, I mean, I, I, you know, I became a. I'm looking at him on my cap, but I don't know if we accurately call Perez like a flop of the weekend when he's been a flop off several weekends. Um, 
but there's always more weekends do you can be a flop it doesn't it's not exclusive to just right. one weekend so. but i feel like um <laughs> yeah we don't rotate on this show. I, I think <laughs> Yeah, this is probably the most interesting is the sort of unpredictable uh, unpredictability because it's brand new and the extreme cold, lack of humidity. Um, but somehow Prez is, is going to mess it up. I've just been disappointed with him. Like you have to hate someone before. I don't hate him, but you know, like when you love someone and you're a fan, then you get the most passionate about their failures. Um, but... Yeah, it's me as a Ferrari fan, mate. You just described that perfectly. <laughs> right. Right, so I feel that way about Perez. I relate the most to Perez because with similar age, he's a family man, um, similar story of being in the big league, um, similar story like I've done, mo- mo- but I just kind of have that affinity with underdog story, but not quite reaching but the potential of everything. And I don't know, that kind of just relates to me uh, a little bit. So he's going to flop <laughs> in some way, including crashing out and into a wall. We're talking about a lot. Of, I'm talking about a lot of war crashing, but it's, it's going to be a very. American. We know what you're expecting this weekend. Seb. Uh, I'm almost timid to ask what the bold prediction is going to be from Seb, but we'll have to wait and see. Um, I mean, Perez. Yeah, I, I can understand that. I mean, he's 32 points ahead of Hamilton now in the drivers' championship. I think the the, the low the misfortunes in Brazil for Hamilton and how much Mercedes struggled that could have proven to have been the difference between P2 and P3 in the drivers' championship. And you know, in a way. With Red Bull, with all the stuff that's going on with Perez and all the doubts that they may have over him, he could have sealed P2 in the Drivers' Championship, which Red Bull have never done a 1-2 in the Drivers' Championship. That could be enough to keep him in that seat next season. Yeah, and Daniel will be quite annoyed at that. <laughs> yeah, actually he might take it out on one of the walls perhaps this weekend in frustration. <laughs> we'll have to wait and see. Uh, pole position now. Um, I'm going to go first. I'm going to go Max Verstappen. Oh, that's juicy. Right, I mean, it's I probably predictable. Sha- I don't want to say Charles Leclerc because that means he's not going to win. <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> I'm going to say Charles Leclerc just to... No. no. I was going to say, <laughs> say Charles for pole as well, I'm afraid, Adam. Oh, dang it. Uh, well, I'm going to go Leclerc to win because he's Ooh. not on pole, so he <laughs> might win. There you I'm go. Do Max to win then, yeah. <sighs> yeah, Lee? I'm going to say Max to win as well. I mean, Charles is on pole. Who else wins when Charles is on yeah, pole? Yeah, I know. It's literally just the, the rule of opposites. That's why I didn't pick him to be on pole position. If he gets on pole on Saturday, on well, yeah, Saturday morning, I'd be like, ah, oh, there we go. It's not going to happen. We'll see. Live in hope. Uh, the podium. So second and third spots on the podium. So for me, uh, I'm going to go Max Verstappen, P2. And I'm going to be, oh yeah, I'm going to go Carlos Sainz, P3. I think he's going to have a good weekend. So, uh, yeah, why not? Let's be ambitious for the Scuderia. Um, Seb, who's second and third for you this weekend? No, I, I'm thinking of, um, you know, I'm gonna, I am I said Prez is going to be a flop. But if he's not a flop, or maybe he maybe he might be P1 and he flopped his way down to P2. I, I know Perez was kind of marketed as a sort of master off the, off the streets. Um, so I'm gonna be a bit optimistic. I want the the thing is is that it's unpredictable because um, it's a new new track. But Max is just proven to be really quite dominant. Um, so, but I still want to be unpredictable. So I want to say I want to say Prez is gonna be up there. But I also do think Sign because I, I remember his performances in, in terms of his. It's new and. I can I can just imagine George Russell whining about something and Lewis Hamilton <laughs> well, whining about something. I mean, they're, they're, they're British. They're just, I mean, that's what we do. Like. <laughs> so, so that whining yeah. is going to play. But I think Carlos Sainz is, is going to, there's going to be some sort of like strategic masterclass or just the whole idea of if it's a new track, I'm going to try and focus it. So I'm going to put Sainz and Perez. Uh, Perez just on the basis of the master of the street circuit, whatever. And then Sainz just because based on his pipe, I think it was Singapore, wasn't it? Um, yeah. That was the big one. Yeah. Yeah, so I'll go with that. Yeah, I mean, it's a good one because, um, I mean, we, people often ignore Carlos Sainz, you know, despite the chaos that has been at Ferrari this year. Once again, like we saw in 2021, Carlos is able to just get the results and they add up over the course of the season where Leclerc has the peaks. But, you know, you'd want him to deliver a bit more consistently, perhaps, or perhaps have better luck by his own admission. Uh, Lee, did we do the podium for you? No. No, we haven't. Good thing I remembered. So what's on your podium? Uh, so after Max, I'll put Lando for P2 and Carlos for P3. Ah, interesting. So it's poor Charles, one, he drops yeah. off the podium. <laughs> <laughs> we, 
Well, I mean, he's obviously been hit by Ricardo based on the <laughs> Seb's race preview at some point. So uh, I'm waiting for that to happen. Get the bad luck continue. And I'll just, uh, it's the hope that kills you. It really does. But uh, I've got to live in it. Uh, best or the rest. So just for clarification for you new listeners, best of the rest is for who we think the best finisher will be that isn't driving a Red Bull, Ferrari, Mercedes, McLaren or Aston Martin. I think we can put Aston Martin back into that category after their Brazil performance, which I very much think they're going to be strong again this weekend. Um, so let's go to you, Lee. Who's going to be your best of the rest? Uh, Seb already alluded to it earlier, but I'm going to say Alex Albon with that higher speed. He's, I think he's going to be a pain on that street for anyone behind him. How about you, Seb? Yeah, I was going to say um, Albon as well, but uh, to build, uh, provide a different answer to Lee, uh, I mentioned it. Ricardo is going to do something interesting just because, you know, he, he likes Vegas. So he likes the idea of it. Sure, that might play it, it, into the sort of, you know, we were talking about Charles, Charles Leclerc and his mind, right? Where his mental state at. So maybe that might play into it. Um, I actually, it's worth mentioning, I don't know, I had an opportunity to meet Logan Sargent. There's a Home Depot um, that you can meet because Logan, because Vegas doesn't really have any kind of interesting places outside of the ship, honestly. So there's a Home Depot, not too far. Nothing in Vegas is too far, but I could have met him. Um, but I think Logan Sargent, I want to think, because, it, I mean, he's, he's had three home races, and I think he's not done particularly well at any of them. Um, oh, no, he, he got points at Cota, didn't he, because of, of the disqualification. So I went Logan Sargent. Um, oh, no, that would be... No, sorry, I'm, I'm going ahead. I'm going ahead of my thing. Yeah, so I'm going to say Ricardo for, for my best of the rest. And then my bold prediction, just to sort of undercut you, is that Logan Sargent will score points because America or whatever, you know, and we're in America. (laughs) That's that's how that works, right? God bless them. Um, I mean, I'm curious to hear about this uh, this meet with Logan Sargent in the Home Depot. Was that a promotional thing or were you just going around looking to get some new car no, or something and you like see Logan obvious. Sargent in the bathroom aisle or something? No, no, no. Oh, no, 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 no. It, it was a promo thing. So, you know, <laughs> um, so they they gave an address. This, you know, come meet Logan Sargent here in, in the Home Depot. Um, it's not really a great area of town too. And it's just... It's kind of hard to describe if you're not familiar with the nature of Vegas. Like, it's not an old money town. It's very blue collar town. So to meet an F1 star at a Home Depot, which is like B&Q, basically. Yeah, I was just going to say, can you imagine yeah. like having like a promotion saying, meet Lando Norris or George Russell or Lewis Hamilton at your local home base? Yeah, or Wix. that's what it is. Yeah, because <laughs> they like don't random. have like, there's, it's all just commercial it's just like strip malls here, basically. So that I found very interesting. Um, so yeah, yeah, Logan Sargent. I mean, I don't know what date it was, but it just got promoted. It just got on, on my news feed. Yeah, that's what. That's a perfect description. It's like meet Lando Norris at your local B and Q or home base or like PC World or something. Like it's really yeah, that's quite. It was quite interesting. Well, there you go. I mean, if Zach Brown's listening, get in touch with B and Q. They've already got the orange gear. Get Lando in an orange apron. Start selling swatches for paint. It's got to work, something like that. Um, I mean, we're not going to talk too much about new liveries because I think everybody's practically got a Vegas livery of some sort this weekend. Um, but we'll move on to the bold predictions. And of course, Seb uh, already mentioned, for those that uh, were listening to the anecdote, that um, Logan Sargent in the points this weekend at his home race again, as you rightly pointed oh, out in Cota. So that would be, cool. yeah, why not? Why not? Got to go for it. Uh, Lee, let's come to you. What's your bold prediction this weekend? Actually, it's a similar vein vein to Seb that I was going to say uh, Williams in the points, but I can be driver specific if you want me to be driver specific. If that's too vague, uh, yeah, let's be driver specific. Why not? Alex Albon in the points. Okay, um, yeah, I think that's a good shout as well. I think Williams are going to be very good this week and definitely a team to watch out for. I actually missed out my best of the rest, so I'm going to throw in uh, Daniel Ricciardo because I know I forgot to uh, put one in myself. So I'm going to say Ricciardo because I'm very much infused by. Uh, Seb's prediction this weekend on Ricardo, so I'm going to back him to do well. And the Alpha Tower has been quite decent as well of late, so why not? My bold prediction, now this is going to be very left field. And for anyone that's followed this season, for the American races, I've been very left field with some of my predictions. Um, and I kind of want to point it towards a quick story that, that's been doing the rounds this week about uh, Vegas. And one thing in particular that we've seen a lot of is the wedding chapel that's been erected in the paddock 
where apparently you can legally get married or elope in the wedding chapel in the F1 paddock. So my bold prediction on that is at some point throughout this weekend on the broadcast, we are going to see a couple get married at that paddock. Because, I mean, it's Vegas. The fact that they've broadcast it and publicised it to everyone, it's got to happen. So they must have a couple lined up somewhere that's going to be in the paddock and say, you know what, let's just get married in the F1 paddock, to be honest. I actually and think then, that that's, yeah. you're, no, you're right about that, but there's going to be, it's going to be like kind of embarrassing in the sense that there's going to be not just one <laughs> couple, there's going to be multiple couples with your idea. Oh, there's going to be a queue. Idea. Yeah. So it's just going to be cringe and like, you know, like one, the broadcaster, one broadcaster will film it and then another couple is going to be doing it and be like, like start off we've already got that coverage and people are just gonna keep trying doing that it's kind of like you know, like the tiktok challenges that happen in this country it might really bleed over to the uk but yeah i'm pretty sure yeah that, that's a really good one that's a really good because that's gonna but happen they will eat it up on the broadcast it doesn't get much more vegas than that to be honest like seeing that particular nf1 will love it it's the, it, it's literally a, a, a marriage made in heaven right there between the two and um no i am not envious in any way now that I'm engaged as well, I'm not having any plans to go to Vegas and get married in the F1 paddock. So I think my uh, partner doesn't have to worry about that, as fun as that might be uh, for some F1 fans. But uh, you must yeah. prefer Monza. You wouldn't want to get married in Vegas. Oh, wow. Well, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, t- it's tempting. But um, yeah, yeah, I mean, obviously, Monza would be much preferable. Being a Ferrari country would be much more home there. But uh, yeah, I, I just think my bold prediction, yeah, I think it's going to come in. As I said, I'm a bit wacky with these US-based ones. I think in Miami, I said someone was going to dive in that pool because they put actual oh. water in that. But I don't think that happened, annoyingly. So I feel like F1 missed a trick there, considering uh, everyone moaning about there was no water in the little fake marina yeah, that the they my, put. The Miami, Miami Grand Prix was odd because it just was like a hot... It's like it's not a very inspiring area of Miami they were in. Uh, just and you go around, It's like underneath highways and it just doesn't look it looks like nothing so i'm hoping yeah. the las vegas race will be as advertised when you think miami you think the beach you know you've got those, those high rises pretty dense in the but none of that it looked it was a pretty terrible looking in terms of the track aesthetic and that's what you're going for a show and i sure as heck hope yeah vegas is gonna you see everything the lights the bellagio fountains and whatnot so fingers crossed yeah Martin Brundle's grid walk is going to be very memorable this weekend. I'm sure he's going to come across plenty of characters, uh, especially following what happened in Brazil with MGK. But uh, we'll move on to that one anyway. But I think that's all we've got time for, guys. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in if you have listened. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And as I said already, if you're new on the YouTube channel, like the video, subscribe to the channel. And of course, if you're listening to us on your favourite audio platform, make sure to leave us a five-star review. It really does help us out a lot. Um, But I think that's all we've got time for, guys. As always, thanks for tuning in. Please stay safe. And we'll see you on the next episode of the DNF1 F1 podcast. And remember, as always, if you're not first, you're probably DNF1. Take care. Goodbye.